so all of it so all of our programs are certified and accredited by the life sciences sector skill development council government of india so any program which we clinic minds offer for the e learning today space we uh, we uh, these programs are certified and when we say certified uh, that means all your final exams once you complete the program your final exams are conducted on the government portal uh, which is by the life sciences sector skill development council your final certifications will come from there uh, in addition to this clinimines uh, diploma uh, is there you get hands on internship built in into the programs their gcp certifications done so fairly comprehensive extensive program all programs are supported by excellent placement support system so we have a 360 degree you know placement support when i say 360 degree I mean it's not just arranging interviews but we prepare you for the job roles uh, we will uh, give you the uh, you know mock interviews prepare you for the interviews uh, aptitude tests uh, poster presentations so it's the overall development it's not just a scientific and technical training but also things like communication skill poster uh, presentations group discussions interview preparation so that before we send you for the interview you are fully uh, prepared for these uh, uh, interviews and we have a fairly active uh, dedicated full time placement cell again handled by a professional who has got over 25 years experience in pharmaceutical industry so we and supported by the team of experts uh, from the hr and the uh, various operational uh, domain so with this uh, i would like to welcome you once again and hand over the session to uh, dr vipra dr vipra Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, hope I am audible to everyone. Uh, Vinay, can you please confirm if I am audible? Yes, sir. Prem, we can hear you. Okay. Thank you so much. So, uh, a very good afternoon to all of you who are present here for today's webinar. I will be sharing my screen. and uh, then we will be discussing about the clinical research and the clinical data management industry the scope and basically what we cover in the curriculum how we prepare you for the industry so just give me a moment and please confirm if you are able to see the slide Uh, Vinayak, are you able to see the slide deck? Not yet, sir. Okay. actually there are some students when i were joining and i'm not able to uh, click on the share option yes the program yeah. ma'am you are right right i understand yeah we can try again i think there's there's there will be time now okay okay so meanwhile while the slide is uh, being uploaded uh, and it's getting shared so uh, to start with what is basically the clinical research and the clinical data management industry so uh, the clinical research industry is an industry 
which has always been existing it's nothing new it has already been existing from years the only difference is that now we are talking more about it the reason being that the pandemic has made all of us aware about this industry the pandemic has actually made the public aware that something of this sort actually exists so clinical research is basically uh, an industry which helps us to develop to bring a safe and an effect, effective or efficient drug into the market uh, is the slide visible now not yet dr ma'am it's saying it's saying presenting but i can't see the slide okay Okay, so basically, whenever I'm trying to share, the list of participants are coming. So it's. Like... Do you want to try again now, if you can? Okay. Actually, the meeting our webinar is for the students are trying to get in, and I am not able to join them. Okay, no problem. Is it visible tonight? Yeah, I I am checking. I still not. I'm still not able to see. Yeah, it will come. Yeah, it's there. Okay, thank you for confirming. Thank you. So basically, what is clinical research? So clinical research is basically it's an investigation. it's an experiment which is conducted on human subjects now why this investigation is conducted why it is important to be conducted because no matter how many experiments we perform on the animal models we perform preclinical studies we perform laboratory studies but still based on that data we cannot market a product we cannot bring a new drug into the market so it's really very important that we gather information related to the safety of the drug and the efficacy of the drug okay safety means in simple words is the drug causing any side effects what kind of side effects or adverse event is it is causing what is the age range in which this event is happening is there any particular gender which is being affected by it what are the kind of events which are more common because there are certain products which uh, where you might have uh, more of headache there might be some products where you have more of you know vomiting tendency so in order to understand the frequency and pattern of the events we need to have data we need to have information similarly efficacy in very simple layman language means is the drug drug doing its intended work for example if you are taking a medicine for pain is the is that drug actually relieving you of the pain is it giving you any benefit yes or no okay so that is what we are trying to study in very layman general language so clinical research broadly helps us to investigate and collect information or collect data pertaining to two major categories that is the safety and the efficacy and how this is done this is done when we administer the new product on the human subjects on live human beings now this research is not conducted straight away this research is conducted only after we have got 
information only after we have got data from the preclinical or the non clinical studies that yes there is a possibility that the product might yield you know promising or successful results in future if it is being investigated on human subjects so that is why we say that these studies the clinical research is conducted only after the satisfactory information has been gathered from the non clinical studies not only this it is also important that we get regulatory approvals you need to have approvals from the regulatory body of the country where the clinical trial is being conducted and second you need to have approval from the ethics committee where the ethics committee gives permission that yes the clinical trial the study can be conducted in a particular hospital or in a particular um, uh, research center okay so the clinical research industry or the clinical research talks about all the phases of clinical trials right from phase 0 to phase 4 in the next slide we will be seeing what what are these phases likewise the clinical data management now what is clinical data management basically the clinical data management is a process where we are ensuring that the data the information which is collected from the clinical trials that information is accurate that information is complete it is logical and it is consistent okay so clinical research is conducted data is generated through data management we assure we ensure that the data is complete it is accurate because what will happen if your data is inaccurate if your data is inaccurate it will lead to inaccurate results inaccurate judgment inaccurate opinion from the regulatory authority and their approval or disapproval will depend on the data that we are submitting to them so if your data is incorrect the approval might like yield some harmful results in future for example today we got an approval of a drug and that mentions that the drug is 99% safe but in reality it is not 99% safe maybe it's only 50% safe it has lot of side effects it has lot of serious adverse events but because of the false information because of the false data the drug got approved so it is very critical in both the industry that we keep a check on the safety accuracy completeness and the logical and consistency of the data now in order to perform clinical data management we use lot of softwares the few softwares which you can see here mentioned these are uh, very few there are lot of other softwares which is specific to the industry which is specific to an organization or to a company but most commonly used softwares are oracle clinical clinsoft meditata rave open clinica my clin so these are few to name moving ahead this is a, a broad picture of the drug discovery and the development process so the first stage is the drug discovery where the drug is discovered in the laboratories where the drug molecule passes through a lot of uh, uh, activities or a lot of procedures like you have the compound identification you have uh, then uh, you, you need to ensure that your compound which has been identified is actually uh, going and working on the target the target of the disease so that comes under the drug discovery stage then we move to the pre clinical development that is our stage 2 pre clinical development is the stage where the drug is tested on animal models or it is tested on uh, you know uh, similar environments like you have uh, uh, in animal models okay so that is the pre clinical development the stage 3 is the major portion which is time consuming and it it ranges from phase 0 to your basically the phase 4 so phase 0 is micro dosing studies which is again it's not mandatory it is optional for a sponsor to perform a phase 0 study or not to perform but nowadays the trend is most of the pharmaceutical companies they prefer doing a phase 0 clinical trial because that gives them a, a slightly clearer picture of what the drug 
or how the drug is going to behave when they expand, when they perform the trials on more number of patients, more number of subjects. Okay. After your phase zero clinical trial, we have a phase one clinical trials. Phase one clinical trials are majorly conducted on healthy human subjects. And the sample size is not quite huge. It is uh, around 20 to 80 healthy volunteers. Post that, we have uh, just a second. Post that, we have a phase two clinical trials, which is conducted on patient population. Now, these patients are, when I say the word patients, this means we perform these clinical trials on the subjects or on the people who are suffering with that particular disease. Now, for example, if you are uh, trying to see, if you are trying to explore whether a product, whether a medication is going to work fine, is it going to uh, be efficient in uh, head and neck cancer? or it is going to be efficient in uh, blood pressure uh, uh, subjects, hypertension subjects or not. So your choice of subject is people who are suffering with hypertension or people who are suffering with head and neck cancer. Okay, So that is the reason why we say patients. So phase two clinical trials we conduct on patients. And the main objective of phase two clinical trial is to check the efficacy. Along with efficacy, the safety data obviously will be monitored. The sample size or the number of subjects is 100 to 300, or we can say it is in few hundreds. Then we come to the phase three clinical trials. Phase three clinical trials are, uh, again, it's one of the largest phase. The reason being very simple that, you one, you have a uh, a greater sample size, you have more number of patients, you have patients in thousands. Second, phase three is basically a deciding stage. It's a pivotal trial. Success or failure, marketing of a product or not marketing of a product majorly depends on your phase three clinical trial. Okay, and it's a a phase which is very rigorously carried out. It's carried out in multiple hospitals at the same time. It may be global studies which is being conducted in India and in other countries as well. And based on the phase three data that we get, then the drug moves to your phase four, which is your post-marketing studies. Okay. Two important aspects here is just before we begin with a phase one clinical trial or just before we begin with clinical trials on human subjects, we have to submit an application to the regulatory body. The application is seeking permission. Similarly, when we talk about phase three clinical trials, after phase three clinical trials, we need to submit an application to the regulatory bodies. And this application is again seeking permission from the regulatory body to market a product, right? And after the regulatory approval has been granted, then the final drug is marketed, right? Moving ahead, we then we'll talk about the key players. Who are the main people who are involved in this, in this entire process? So one thing which I will like to mention here is the industry works on regulations and guidelines. The reason we are going to perform investigations on humans, live human subjects. So it is bounded by a lot of regulations, a lot of guidelines, and there is a very strict policy that you have to adhere to these regulations whenever we are conducting clinical trials. Not only clinical research, the data management industry is also bound by regulations. We have ICGCP guidelines, we have Indian guidelines, we have other country specific guidelines, and these guidelines need to be followed by the players, the key people who are involved in this entire process. So the first player is the sponsor. Sponsor is basically the pharmaceutical company which takes the initiative to perform 
or uh, conduct a clinical trial they are the people who are responsible for financing because clinical trials involves a lot of finances we always talk about finances in us dollars in millions and billions so who is financing who is providing the fund it's the sponsor they provide the entire financing and funding for the clinical trial process second important person is the investigator investigators are the doctors they are the physicians who are involved in the clinical trial process because in order to perform a clinical trial you will need a doctor who will administer the product who will guide the patients accordingly who will counsel the patients and who will keep a monitor monitoring on the day to day progress of the patient how the patient is responding to the product what are the side effects which is happening and they are going to document that data they are going to document each and every uh, slightest of progress which is happening to the patient positive or negative both it's very important that we also capture anything which is adverse which is happening to the patient any positive impact which the drug is causing to the patient both is important so investigators are the doctors who are involved in the conduct or who are involved in carrying out the clinical trials then we have ethics committee ethics committees are basically committees which is not it's it's an entire team it's a committee of people from different background like you have a legal expert you have a medical expert you have a a person who is a social worker you have a lay person you have different uh, 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 or, like organization of different people it's basically called a multi sectorial and a multi disciplinary organization this committee is responsible to review all the study related information and then give their opinion that is it ethical is it uh, scientifically sound that the clinical trial can be conducted in the hospital or in the research center then we have the next key player as the subject now who is a subject subject is the patient a patient who is participating in a clinical trial is called a subject these are the people who are suffering with the disease under study these are the people who are giving their consent and participating in the clinical trial and they are the people who are getting the investigational product or the new drug and we observe the effect on these subjects okay then we have the next person again very important the monitors who is the monitor and what is their role in this entire process so monitors are basically people who are appointed by the sponsors or people who are appointed by the cro and they are responsible to monitor the study they are the people who will visit the hospitals who will visit the research centers where the clinical trial is being performed and they will monitor they will review the data which is collected by the investigators and the other study related staff and they if if they find that okay the data is not correct or the data is uh, not uh, matching with the other related information they will point that discrepancy and they will request the investigator to give more clarification or to provide the correct data so the monitors are a very uh, important you know um, uh, communication link between the investigators and the sponsors right and they are responsible to keep a check on the quality of the data which is being produced during the conduct of the clinical trials then we talk about data we have been using this word since the beginning of my session what is this data data is the information that is being collected for example if i have a patient a and i administer the product on uh, 5th of september to that patient right now i need to document the information that what was the date what was the time what was the quantity what was the batch number or the lot number of the product which was administered to patient a and what was the course of event which happened for example on 6th of september the patient had vomiting so this entire bits of information this is data and this is a very crucial information 
for the sponsors for the regulatory authority for the monitors for the investigators and also for the ethics committee because this is what we are looking at this is what we are keeping a track of okay now this data which is collected throughout the clinical trial this is um, uh, reviewed and then this data is presented in an understandable language understandable language means you provide a summary you provide graphical representation and this is provided after statistical analysis is performed and the data is then submitted to the regulatory authority in the form of a written report which is known as a clinical study report okay so it is important that each and every phase once it is completed we submit the outcome we submit the final result or we submit the end result to the regulatory authority okay now as we progress further before we talk about the syllabus it's very important that the people who enter this industry where the freshers the students or anybody who is a part of this industry not only the freshers even the experienced people they need to have a clear understanding of the entire process important the rules regulations what are the activities which are performed and why this is important if i am saying that okay informed consent is important why it is important what what will happen if the consent is not done okay what is the process flow right so it's very important and industry nowadays looks forward they are looking for candidates who have a a clear understanding on these concepts okay so the syllabus that we have structured here is going to give you an end to end understanding of the entire process the clinical research the clinical data management the entire process will be taught to you so let's have a look at the syllabus one by one so first we'll talk about the clinical research syllabus and then the data management okay Okay, I'm sharing the uh, Excel uh, screen, so please confirm. Yeah, that's coming out. Okay. Okay, I hope it's visible now. Not, not yet.
Okay, so no problem. Even if the screen is not visible, I will brief mm. you. Okay. Yeah. So basically, the course curriculum it starts from drug discovery and development. So in the very first slide, we discussed about the drug discovery and development. So before we even talk about clinical research or we talk about the phases or the regulations. It's important that each one of the students they understand the in drug discovery and the development process. So that is what our module one comprises of. Then in the next module we talk about the clinical research broadly. What are the important terminologies? What are the uh, documents which are used? What are the phases in detail? The module three is completely focused on the regulations and guidelines, where we provide a in-depth understanding of ICH, the different ethical considerations which led to the formation of these guidelines. What were the tragedies which happened in the past? Then we talk about the ICH GCP guidelines, the guideline which was formed in the year 1996. As well as the integrated addendum, that is the E6 R2, which took place recently in 2016. Then we talk about the differences between Indian GCP and ICH GCP because the ICH GCP and Indian GCP they have differences, right? Then we talk about ICMR guidelines, the US FDA and the MR regulations. Uh, the course also comprises of registries. the clinical trial registries like the ctri the clinical trial dot gov and the sugam portal now with the advent of uh, information technology it systems software in the clinical research industry as well the submissions which are done to the regulatory authority that has become very convenient because we do online submissions and that is done through the sugam portal so we take you through the entire portal we train you that what the portal is about how the submissions are done which form is submitted for what kind of approval then we talk about the new drug and clinical trial rules of 2019 then the course comprises of the roles and responsibilities of the key stakeholders like the sponsors the investigators and the ethics committee plus the vendors so who are these people and what are their roles and responsibilities along with this we also will talk about in the next module about the preparation and planning of clinical trials like what is a trial design what is blinding what is randomization what is protocol design and what is crf what is essential documents etmf etmf is again a very uh, sought after uh, you know profile or position which is now in the industry there is lot of recruitment happening in the etmf domain so the course comprises of etmf theory as well as the etmf practical then we have the ind application clinical study report and the nda submission after that the major focus would be on the study startup process like how the site is selected how a hospital is selected to perform a clinical trial what is the site initiation how the site initiation happens what is the contract and budget how the contracts are negotiated what is the cta how does it look like what are the major components of a cta then different strategies different plans which we have when we talk about the patient recruitment because one of the challenges which is faced in the industry is you plan a very good clinical trial but you are not able to recruit the required number of patients okay so there are different plans and strategies for recruitment as well as retention of the patients in the study okay so the course focuses on that as well so you are well prepared when you enter the industry then informed consent process and documentation uh post that we also have sessions on monitoring and monitoring uh, topic comprises of all the monitoring initially we only had on site monitoring where the monitor used to go to the trial site perform the monitoring and come back now we have different kinds of monitoring like you have on site you have remote monitoring you have centralized monitoring you have rbm that is risk based monitoring so each of this topic is included in the curriculum then we talk about the crf review and the source data verification 
drug safety reporting because as i to told you in the beginning that safety is one of the important pillar or one of the important aspects that we monitor when we perform clinical trials so it is very important for the students to understand that what is safety reporting what is serious adverse event reporting what are the timelines how to do the reporting and why it is important okay and then we talk about the site close out and the last module talks about standard operating procedure audits and inspections and electronic records and electronic signature apart from these theoretical sessions we also have practical hands on activities like we have practical hands on activities for safety reporting for source document for drug accountability for uh, informed consent for case report form for protocol so these are practical hands on activities and the theoretical and the practical knowledge combined together prepares a student to confidently enter the industry okay so that it's not only that you go with the theoretical knowledge once you enter the industry you have the practical exposure as well okay next we move to the clinical data management so clinical data management also comprises of the overview to uh, to help you understand that what is the entire process and why this process is important then it talks about uh, you could say slightly smaller but very important topics like data entry guidelines edit checks case report forms case report form tracking data management plan so these are the topics which are covered in the data management uh, along with this data management also focuses on the uh, medical coding medical coding is an important uh, aspect of data management where it is expected that students have a understanding of medra they should have an understanding of who drug inside they should have an understanding of icd classification classification so the course syllabus comprises of all these aspects so that you you are uh, well equipped with that knowledge then we talk about the laboratory tests in clinical trials because when we talk about patients when we talk about investigations laboratory test is an important part so what are these tests how these are performed what are the units and why it is important to analyze to review the lab data why it is so critical okay because lab data gives you a lot of information about the safety profile of a product okay then we talk about the electronic data capture electronic data capture is basically the ecrf how the data is remotely captured how that data is remotely analyzed and evaluated by the key people at the data management department right then we have audit trail audit trail is basically to uh, ensure that there is a chronological uh, uh, you know trail which is generated whenever a data is changed whenever the data is updated edited deleted amended so audit trail is an integral requirement of any software which we used in the clinical research industry apart from this we also talk about reports creating reports in data management we talk about reconciliation of the adverse event data we talk about the audits and inspections in the clinical data management and last but not the least we have sessions on the software because data management industry is um, you know it it works on software you should have a software knowledge so we train the students on the software that is clinsoft and the software is provided for 30 days so access is given to the students for 30 days where the students can themselves practice on the software based on the source data or based on the information that we provide to them okay so you you have the hands on experience now coming to the focus of training so the focus of training in clinamines is the information which we provide to you is adequate in all matters adequate which means it is at par with the industry requirement it is in line with what is latest in the industry it is updated and quality technical knowledge okay so overall the focus of training is we have a structured syllabus which is reviewed and updated 
at least once in a year or more frequently if it is required the training program is uniform so whether you are a part of a regular full time batch or you are a part of a weekend batch the training program is uniform we ensure that you develop an understanding of the importance of clinical research and clinical data management so each one of you understand it it's not only that you just go through the slides and that's it no you should have an understanding and how do we develop this understanding this understanding is developed through practical oriented sessions as you could see we have lot of practical activities which are uh, imbibed into the curriculum so this provides creativity in the session it, it's not monotonous it's not just just that you are going to the slide decks you have something new which you are learning which you are implementing in everyday sessions uh, along Dr. with Vipra, yes sir. Uh, in the interest of the time we'll cover these lot of general topics at the end uh, if we could move to pharmacovigilance now okay sir so just to show uh, we have the two softwares uh, the etms software and the uh, clinsoft that is cdm software so we can move to pharmacovigilance sir dr sai yeah good afternoon everybody this is sayed shah so you can in the interest of the time uh, dr sai keep it about 15 minutes sir. okay I'm going to share my screen. If you can see, do let me know. Yes, we can. So okay. So my name is Sayed Shada. I'm a pharmacovigilance head for the Clinic Mics. Today I'm going to talk about the pharmacovigilance. So what? we need to understand what is pharmacovigilance why it is important and uh, how we are going to train you on the pharmacovigilance pharmacovigilance in simple terms means drug safety now what is drug safety you ask me the questions what is drug safety does the drug do not have any adverse drug reactions or any side effects i will say no because A anything, any matter in this world had has got its own risk. Okay, so each drug which is available in the market, if you go and see, you will find a list of adverse drug reactions. That means we have captured this adverse drug reaction from the sources. Now, what are those sources? It is from the clinical trials and also from the post marketing. Okay, so as a PB officer, you because nowadays all the health authorities require a pharmacovigilance person who is a link between the health authority and the pharma company without the pharmacovigilance person you cannot you, you cannot run your business it's a mandatory for any drug, uh, uh, any new drug registrations or approval uh, renewal of the drug you need to have a pharmacovigilance system in place and there should be a pharmacovigilance in the uh, officer in charge as per the indian regulations who is the link where you have to mention their name into the health authority and he will be the link between the health authority and the pharma industry so as 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 a pharmacovigilance officer you will be more satisfied to do to this this job because you are saving your patient you are saving your patients and also you are saving your product and also you are saving your company this is how the pharmacovigilance works so coming to the definition of the pharmacovigilance pharmacovigilance is the science and activities relating to the detection now how we will detect the adverse drug reaction or side effects assessment and understanding and prevention of adverse effect or any other medicine or vaccine related problems so here as a pharmacovigilance person we need to have a system in place in order to identify the safety information it will, it is not only the adverse drug reactions as you, as you can see the definition it is also the other medicine related problems okay what do you, what do you mean by other medicine related problems it can be the medication errors off label use drug abuse misuse drug drug interactions drug overdose underdose occupational exposure etc these are all medicine related problems so 
these are the risk factor for the adverse reaction for safety of your information. So we need to have a system in place where we can identify the medicine, identify the adverse reactions or adverse events or medicinal problems from the market. Where we are going to assess those problems, we need to know what is the cause of the problems and how we can how we can ensure that these drugs are the harms have been minim, uh, the harm reaching to, to the patient have been prevented or if you cannot prevent at least you can uh, you, you, you can minimize the harm causing to the patients this is the overall concept of the pharmacovigilance pharmacovigilance means pharmacom means drug vigil means to be alert you have to be alert in the uh, you have to be uh, alert throughout your drug processes from the so when when your job will start it will start from the day one of the clinical trial till your last dose of drug is available to the patients so as a pharmacovigilance person you are very important without you the pharmaco the you the company will not have the business without the pharmacovigilance the company may not, may shut down the business so that's that's very important for us you take care of the patients so if you cannot take care of the patients, then your drug will be at risk and also your company will be at risk. So here is the basic concept of pharmacovigilance given by the Hippocrates Admin The code is by the Hippocrates Admin at least do not harm. If you cannot benefit the patient, at least do not harm. So always the um, if, uh, or always the, um, the harm call, harms affect the economic or economy uh, economy of the family of the individual family or the country will come to that so always think safety first because without the safety you cannot get the approval of the products so the product may be a magical product uh, to treat a condition for example if you have you have the uh, you have the drug to treat the parkinson's disease and that can lead to stroke uh, stroke in one in ten patients. So does this drug will have the approval because Parkinson's disease disease now is uh, is you, you don't have the uh, proper medications to treat this condition. We 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 don't have the cure, complete cure, uh, or complete medications to cure this disease. So if the drug is, uh, is we have invented the drug and which says that. The drug is magical and it can cure the Parkinson's disease, but it is associated with the incidence of stroke. Stroke is a serious adverse reaction. So in one in 10 patients means it's very common. So does this drug will be approved? No, it will not get, get approved because safety is always important along with the efficacy. So safety, think safety first because you cannot put the patient at risk at any uh, from the uh, we cannot put the patient at risk at all so if you have the efficacy 100 percent efficacy then also your drug may not get approved by the health authority because it has got higher risk so always the benefit should outweigh the risk when you have the pharma when you have when we uh, approve the, when the health authority approve the products so what is the background here? Because the pharmacovigilance is in very evolving field. Because it's it's not the uh, it's, it's it's not the static one. Because before, if you go back to the 1960s, we we used to have the drugs be, be approved mainly on the efficacy because the safety was not that important at that point of time. So here is the example of the drug, which is the thalidomide, which was widely used in late 1950s and early 1960s for the treatment of nausea in pregnant women, which is the morning sickness in pregnant women. So in the European country, this drug was approved in the Euro European countries and over the counter, this drug was available. This drug was a very magical drug to treat the morning sickness in pregnant patients. So what happens is since the drug was freely available in the market over the counter, the pregnant patients started taking these medications. So after a um, so after a certain time, after a year or two year or a year or two, the 
health authorities started no noticing that there's a lot of baby was, were born without the forelimb which is called pocomalia so uh, after in started investigation they found that all all the mothers who had such, such baby has taken the tal thalidomide during the pregnancy now this what is the impact the impact is that this people these children they cannot be independent on their own so even they cannot work or they cannot do the job on their own anything so they need the support of their parents again if the parent doesn't go to work again it will be, it will be an economical impact to the family and also for the country so this has changed the concept of drug approval in the by the health authorities from from here onwards the health authority made it compulsory that no we need to have the safety data in order to get the drug approved we need to do the safety study also that's why we this we had the stringent regulations now where we we where we need to provide the safety of the drug in order to get the approval if you go to, if you if you have a look on the how the approval process takes place how the clinical trials has been done so each clinical trial protocol accompany the safety evaluation or safety aspect of the product so how you are going to perform the safety study how you are going to capture the safety information so it is uh, all protocol a clinical trial protocol is accompanied with the safety sections so here we, we the, the 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 safety of the product start when the first day of drug use in humans and it will end till the last dose of the drug is available in the market so again if, you, if the drug has been withdrawn the it has to be deregistered in order to not to comply with the safety regulations so you can imagine your your job is there till the company is there so based on that we have a multiple uh, regulations current um, i'm not getting detail into the uh, in the previous regulations we'll just go, go into the what are the current regulations because we have the current regulations that is ema regulations where we have all the countries in the economic uh, in the european economic area are bound to do bound to the ema regulations here all the ema countries have a single regulations so uh, and it's managed by the European Medicine Agencies. So it has got the good pharmacovigilance practice for to, for, to, to, to take care of the pharmacovigilance. It is a pharmacovigilance guidance and it's effective since before that we, they, they had the different versions of the guidelines, which is volume 9A. Now they have the good pharmacovigilance practice effective since 2012, which, con which consists of 16 modules. Now also we, we have currently we have a post-marketing uh, 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 pharmacogenes regulation uh, issued by uh, uh, released by the CDSCO, okay, which is pharmacovigilance guidance document for marketing authorization of pharmaceutical products in India. And CDSCO is the health authority in India effective since Jan 2018. It's, it's, and it contains the module six. So and we have also have the US FDA, which is the, which is governed by the 21 CFR. 21 is the title, CFR is the Code of Federal uh, Regulations. So each country, most of the countries now the, the PV is evolving. Before PV is all, always there in clinical trials, as Dr. Vipra uh, we, 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 we explained you, because safety is uh, is 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 associated with the efficacy. It, it is not a, it is not considered as separate. Um, separate field now because always the safety and efficacy goes together because the safety of the product is not fully understood in clinical trials because of their various limitations so we need to have the uh, safety study uh, to, to, to capture the safety information post authorization now you may ask the questions why we need to have the safety information after the after drug has been authorized now we have the drug authorized and the we can market the drug so again what's the reason obviously the safety doesn't end still because in clinical trials we are restricted because in clinical trials 
we the company decide who whom whom we study the drug we have the inclusion and the exclusion criteria where we choose the patients we choose the patient is adult the, the patient is not breastfeeding the patient is not a, a, a geriatric or pediatric or patient is not pregnant the patient is not suffering from so and so diseases and the patient is not taking so so and so many drugs we should not uh, do the uh, clinical trials with multiple drugs together and check all drug interactions of the of, of the investigational drug with the other drugs so here we have the limitations so once we get the approval and the number of patients in clinical trials will be 5000 6000 at a maximum 10000 so when it comes to the market we are not the we are not the uh, person who choose the patients it's the physician is the physician who choose who prescribe our medication to the patient irrespective of the label because he is the best he he he, he does the best choice for the for his for his or her patient now your drugs have been exposed to different populations uh, did, uh, your, your drug has been exposed to different diseases and multiple drugs which is available in the market including the allopathic drug homeopathic drug uh, natural uh, uh, remedies the patient is taking homeopathic drugs so here the behavior of your patient may change and you have the rio drug has will be exposed to a huge number of population the population worldwide is around 7 billion and the you the, the patient may take the drug for long the patient may have the issues of drug abuse mis misuse so all this we need to take care in the post marketing there might be a new safety information which may harm the patients what are the restrictions we need to follow in order to prevent this or minimize this harm to reaching the patient always if you cannot prevent the harm, always minimize the harm. So, for example, if you have the uh, drug, uh, as for example, a drug X, so which has been treated, uh, which has been uh, treated in, the, in in all the pop populations to uh, to to treat the uh, as an anticoagulant. Now, after some times, the you, you may receive the higher number of cases of bleeding. Now, uh, we need to know why the bleeding has happened. In the clinical trials, the bleeding was very rare. Now it has changed to the frequency has changed to per common. So why this happened? So you need to investigate. It is it is because of the age factor which is affecting the bleeding. It is because of the disease factor which is affecting the bleeding. It is because of the drug food interactions which is affecting the bleeding, or it is is that drug drug interactions which is affecting the bleeding. So we need to identify what is the risk factors for, for this bleeding. Then we may have, in, in case if the patient, if the drug is aspirated to kidney, and the, 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 you, you, you have seen these bleeding cases in, in case of the severe renal failure patient, then you may come up with the restrictions saying that the, our drug is contraindicated in using this drug, in using these uh, medications, in using this, uh, using this medication in severe renal failure. This is how we save the, our product because the company invests a lot in the, in, 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 for the invention of the products. So here, the company has to get back the money. We, we and within the short period of time that it is the during the patent time uh, after that the drug will be allowed for the generic to, to come in, into the markets so here we need to save our product we, we first we need to save our patient once you start saving the patient you will save your product and also save your company otherwise if you cannot save the patients then you, you, they, there might be an um, issues as associated with the use of products and the health authority put, may put the restrictions on your products or they may fine or they may ban your products. That's why always protect your patients, then you, it will protect your drug and it will protect your company. So no pharmacovigilance, no company, no drugs. So without the pharmacovigilance systems, you cannot run a company, you cannot run your business. So who is involved in pharmacovigilance? Or, or, uh, uh, Dr. Said, we have another five, seven minutes now. Okay. Uh, so who is involved? I will just go, go to uh, fast patients, healthcare, because patients are, are the ones who are using the medications and healthcare professionals, doctors, nurses, etc. Then we have the uh, regulatory authorities because these regulatory authorities, they are the one who 
provide the access to the medication who approves the medication or who uh, and who uh, re renews the medications in order to use in the patients otherwise you, you will not uh, your drug will not be available to the patients then we have the pharmaceutical companies pharmaceutical companies are the manufacturer of the medications and they are the one who provide the, the provide the access to the uh, access to who provide access, uh, access to the medicine to the patients then uh, we what uh, activities the pharmacovigilance uh, systems will have is the collecting and managing of the data of the safety of medications looking at the data to detect signals signals means any new information because we know the uh, what are the side effects or adverse reactions during the clinical trials and we submit this data and we get the approval based on the risk uh, benefit risk analysis so even after the as we told once the drug has been in the market you may have the new adverse drug reaction or there might be a change in the frequency uh, fre frequency or the severity of the adverse drug reaction that's called the signals so always we need to manage the signals so evaluating the data and making decisions with regard to safety issues proactive risk assessment to minimize any potential associated risk. We have to think in advance, what are the risks associated with, maybe associated with the, your product use. So, and you have to monitor the patients. So we, we, you may have the additional risk minimization measures in order to prevent, safeguard the patients or prevent these major uh, adverse drug reactions. So acting to protect public health again, communicating with and informing stakeholders. Who are the stakeholders? It may be the your third parties, the distributors. You are internally. It can be your medical affairs, regulatory affairs, uh, product quality, quality uh, department, and externally we have the health authorities and the third parties whom you are dealing with. Maybe distributors, CROs, data management, etc an audit of the outcomes and key processing also audit is the uh, is the key uh, key aspects of the quality management so without the audit you cannot have the you, you cannot ensure that you have this safe, safe system in, in place so audit is also a first step for uh, a first step for the preparation of the inspections so you will be very confident if you conduct the audits uh, of your systems so what pharmacological ensures is it should, it, will, it should ensure a dedicated platform to communicate safety and efficacy of the product because capturing is not only the um, uh, the capturing of the safety information is only the it's not only the goal because we need to communicate we need to communicate with the health authority we need to communicate with the healthcare professional because the healthcare professional is the one who is prescribing the medications and how you are going to communicate what is how effective your communication is and to promote the rational and safe uses of medications because the, the right patient should get the right treatment and the right dose and the right time that's called rational use of medications and timely assessment and the communication of risk benefits of the of drugs on the market so we need to all, all, always check that whether uh, our drugs benefits the uh, or always the risk benefits always the risk and so that the drug is, remains in the market for the longer period of time to, 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 serving the patients educating and informing patients consumers stakeholders on the risks and risk management how what are risks how we can minimize the risk how we can prevent risk with the use of patient education material or the healthcare education material physician education material, material etc so there will there will there will be always routine risk minimization in in, in the form of the um, patient information leaflet or smp system some summary of product characteristics so what are the opportunities available? So you have a lot of opportunities, as, as I told you, because all the pharmaceutical companies need to appoint a pharmacovigilance officers as per the regulation. In India, you have over thousands of pharmaceutical company within India. Uh, uh, outside the outside India also, you have lots of pharmaceutical co company. If if they want to ma uh, market the drug in, in, in within India, then then they, 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 they need to obtain a import license, and the import mm -hmm. license will, will be the MHO, uh, the one who owns the import license will be the marketing authority holder. So all the whether is the import license holder as a manufacturer, uh, all the pharmaceutical companies they need to have a PV officer in charge as per the regulation. So you your your job is fixed. So your opportunity is fixed there. So, so you, all companies need to they may appoint one, they may appoint two, they may appoint the full team based on the business model of the company, or they may outsource. So one is hundred percent sure with each company. 
if if they are outsourcing the their task to to, to the third party th that means also you need to uh, assign one person as a for the company for the mh holder and third party sales providers here yes, third party service provider they, they, for example in, in our country we have many third party service providers like cro's Okay, and on and and the Tata Consumer Services with Cognizance, um, Accenture, where they provide service to the multinational companies in in case processing, aggregate report writing, signal management, etc. IQVIA, etc. These are the big companies who are already in the Indian markets, and they have the Indian in Indian market is considered as the India is considered as the hub for the clinical research and pharmacovigilance. Then you also may work in the health authorities because the health authorities need the expertise to manage the pharmacovigilance system. Because they have in India is a huge country and we have lots of manufacturers, uh, CROs, the uh, importers of the drugs. So you we need a huge team to manage the to inspect these these organizations or uh, and to, to to take care of the of the compliance of Say, all sir, the in the interest of the time could you move to the program structure please yeah okay yeah. okay so we have to cover uh, yeah, other yeah. sessions and yeah sure sure so here we we in pharmacovigilance we, we in okay, clinicians are experts we we, we know what is required by the industry and we have uh, uh, organized a structured program so to to meet the requirements of the uh, pharma industries so we have we, we have nine modules where we train the all, all the uh, uh, students on how to work in different areas if you want to work as a case processor, if you want, we want to work as a PB officer, or if you want to work as a risk management per, uh, expert or signal management expert, etc. So we cover all the aspects in this now nine models. So the nine models covering basic in clinical research, pharmacology of the medications, even the pharmacology of medications. Also, we have one module for uh, for that, and we also have the complete pharmacovigilance training, which 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 will be covered in the rest of the modules. So, module one, we have the the basics overview of the clinical research. Where you, you, where Dr. Vipra will be taking these uh, sessions, we have where she will be discussing the phases of the clinical trials and what are the guide, guidelines used to, uh, to comply with the clinical research, mainly the ICH and G, ICGCP guidelines. Then, module two, we have we will general principles of pharmacology. pharmacology. Well, we, here we will discuss about the various drugs uh, used in. Uh, you, uh, you very very just you use to treat the diseases and its pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics parameters how they are going to affect the safety of the product and what is um, how, well, the, the, the the drug classification and the mechanism for actions so disease pathology and pharmacotherapy so what is the best pharmacotherapy available for each diseases and how we can uh, look into the uh, disease treatment so module three, we have the introduction to pharmacovigilance. Here we will give you overall picture about the pharmacovigilance from where the pharmacovigilance has started from from the from the reporting of the first adverse drug reactions. Now where till it, it has reached? What are the different terminologies used in this um, uh, in pharmacovigilance? So we will uh, brief you all on all, all the terminologies used uh, in pharmacovigilance, and we also. Uh, we also explain you about the what are the similarities and difference between the uh, pharmacovigilance in <laughs> in clinical trials because we have the pharmacovigilance in clinical trials and also in post marketing. So what are the difference and what is the similarity between the pharmacovigilance in clinical trials and what pharmacovigilance in post marketing? So this we have already been uh, discussed. You need bright um, brief background about how we, you can you know, what is the difference between uh, uh, pharmacovigilance in clinical trials and post marketing. Then we have the mod module four. We will here we will cover about uh, cover all the regular pharmacovigilance regulations, especially the global, which are uh, which are the uh, the main ph ph uh, pharmacovigilance uh, guidelines. Like EMA, we we have which right now it is considered as the 
complete uh, pharmacovigilance guidelines uh, and which is accepted accepted by by the worldwide health authorities so most of the health authorities they develop their guidelines um, referring to the ema guidelines so we will talk about the ema gu guidelines what are the ema guidelines will cover the good is, is the good pharmacovigilance practices it contains 16 modules and also we will talk about the fda 21 the CFR part 11 then Council of International Organization of Medical Sciences CIOMS, and also we will cover the Indian regulations in module 4 in module 5 we will have we will provide you the hands-on training on case processing and report generations so what actual lab software we are we will we, we, we will provide you the access the login user ID and the password in order and we will provide you the sample cases in in order for, for you to go and work in onto the actual system and how to take the reports what are the reports required for the pharmacovigilance how you can generate the uh, reports from these systems etc so here you will get the hands-on training on the case processing and the report generation using the lab system then we have the module six which is safety reporting, including medical information and processing of ICS cells. So here we need to understand the from where the safety reports. Uh, what are the sources of the safety reports? How we can, uh, what we need to do in order to make sure that we are compliant with the regulatory requirement. For example, if we are receiving the uh, safety reports from the medical information or the product quality team, then we need to have the or any CROs then we what system we need to play we, we, we need to ensure in order to comply with the uh, regulatory requirement because we need to here we need to have the reconciliation done periodic periodic reconciliation so this all will, will be discussed in the module six of the uh, training program then we have the module seven which will talk about the aggregate report signal detection and risk management aggregate reports means the vital role in in, in pharmacovigilance uh, reportings in clinical trials we we, we need to uh, sub, uh, uh, submit the dsur development total safety update report we need to prepare these reports for the uh, 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 every year for, for in order to comply with the clinical trial regulation and submit it to the investigator ethics committee and the health uh, authorities then we have the signal detection signal detection is again the continuous continuous process it's it's also it's it's from the clinical trials till it will uh, be there till it, the drug is available in the market so we here we need to identify these signals and how to manage the signals we will learn how to identify the signals and how we will validate and manage the signals uh, what are the risks associated with the signals and how you can manage the risk new risk old risk and uh, both uh, both associated with the use of med med medications then we have the module eight, which talks about the documents in pharmacovigilance. Where, where, because the pharmacovigilance process should, should, should uh, have, will have the SOPs, working instructions, the SDEA, safety data action agreement. We can also call it as PBA because uh, here it, it pharmacovigilance system involves a lot of do do documentations. It's most uh, and all the processes and all the um, all the all, 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 right, sir. I think we need to end this now module. Okay. I'm sorry because I think students have other. Things. I think we will uh, talk about now SAS. Actually, Neeraj, sir, I would like to invite you on the uh, SAS presentation. Yes, Thank sure, you, sure. Thank you very much, sir. I am just presenting my screen. Just let me know, can you see my screen now? Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah, OK. Uh, I think it won't open. So it says you can drop your screen. You know, you can try now. Yeah, OK. Can you see now? Still 
Vidak sir, you can try again. I can't see your screen. Okay. Now, can you see my screen? Hello? Jan, sir, I'm waiting. I can't see your screen. You can share with Vinayak and he can share with the screen. It's the present now button is next to the raise hand. Yeah, uh, I am just trying again. Vinayak, can you please confirm? Yeah, I, I will confirm when I see it. Yeah. Neerav, you can log out and then log in. Okay, it works. In... Join again. Yeah, okay, sure. I am joining again. Well, Neerav sir joins and we'll take all the questions at the hand. Please, uh, uh, we'll take all the your questions about the program structure, everything we will take at the end. Yeah, I have joined the call, sir. I am just sharing my screen again. Am I audible? Yes. Yeah, yeah I am just sharing my screen. Yeah, just let me know if you are able to see my yes. screen. Yes, I will let you. Yeah. Yes, we can. It's yeah. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So, first, let me introduce myself. So, my, I am Nero Mystery. I have done MFAM in pharmacology, and I have around eleven years of experience in uh, clinical sales programming, and I have worked with uh, multiple MNC companies, uh, Pharma plus CRO, uh, in uh, clinical trials. So today I'm here to present a small introductory session on uh, SAS clinical trial programmer and its scope. So what is today's agenda? So I will cover the role of SAS in clinical trial, then uh, clinical SAS work process, then growth of SAS in clinical research, then why should you be in the clinical SAS industry, then what are the entry level job roles and growth in uh, SAS programming, and finally how we teach and train people uh, for SAS programming job. Okay, so first we will see what is the role of SAS in clinical trial. So now in industry, uh, we require two types of skills. So one is hard skill and another is soft skill. So your hard skills means your uh, subject matter expertise means in which subject you are expertise, which may be your statistics, which may be your SAS, which may be your pharmacology, anything it may be. Okay, so it's called hard skill. Then your math, statistical knowledge, then data technical skills, all these skills comes under the hard skill. Now in industry, if you want to grow apart from this hard skill, you also require the soft skill like uh, uh, problem solving ability, storing, telling capacity, how you collaborate with your uh, subordinate and your superiors, then uh, how you are curious about learning new things, then your communication and ultimately the creativity in the job. Okay. So if the person has both of these skills, definitely he will grow in the industry. Now, why we require the statistical software? Okay, now as in previous session, you understand what is clinical trial and uh, uh, in clinical trial, actually we produce a huge volume of data. Okay, so it will be very difficult, you know, uh, to uh, analyze those clinical trial data using the our traditional Excel or whatever the online software uh, are available. So uh, we, which is actually, you know, very time consuming and, uh, you know, manual computation uh, uh, will be you know error prone so for this reason we require a statistical software so actually SAS is one of such software so we use this SAS software in a clinical trial to analyze the data and to submit the data to the health authorities 
so why we use the SAS? okay so in SAS, we can analyze the advanced statistical analysis uh, which, which are much more accessible uh, we can also you know uh, analyze the non-standard data comparatively SAS is very faster okay in a fraction of second you know you can run the program and you can analyze the data of clinical trial data okay uh, it is a better reporting tool okay for reporting purpose as well we use the SAS software it means uh, the clinical trial data we present it into the word file and this word file we you know uh, submit to the health authorities so it is a better reporting tool and it says uh, we can store the large volume of data so it, it acts as a warehousing okay and it is very popular worldwide nowadays now first we will see the what is the history of SAS. So SAS stands for Statistical Analysis System. It was uh, first developed by Jim Goodnight and John Shell in 1970 at NC University. It was actually initially developed for the agriculture research, but later it was majorly used in clinical research, banking sector, market research, everywhere SAS is used, okay? Today we will discuss uh, what is the role of SAS in clinical research, okay? Now, SAS Institute was founded in 1976. Okay, it, it is originally from USA. Okay, and 98 of a uh, world's top 100 companies in Fortune 500 use SAS software, and it is CFR Part 2 compliant. CFR stands for Code of Federal Regulation, which is you know conducted by the USA. Now, I will uh, show you how SAS look like. So, in SAS, actually, we have mainly the five five windows. Uh, so, this is the editor window. Uh, second is log window, then explorer window, then output window and result window. When you open the says it will look like this. Okay. In editor window, we generally write the code. This is a code syntax program. Okay. You must be aware of the C language, right? So same way uh, in uh, editor window, we write the code here. And when we run the particular code, it will generate the output. Now, the what is the purpose of this log window so whenever you run the code okay in says so if you find any uh, error or warning and any note in your code or any malfunction in co your code or program so it will reflect into the log window so by seeing the log window you can confirm that whether my code is working properly or not or do i need to rectify it so by uh, rectifying this uh, you can again your turn your code now in explorer window uh, we have libraries where we store our clinical trial data. Okay, we have permanent as well as the temporary libraries. Now, after running the code, whatever the result is generated, okay, we we can see it in output window, and uh, final result will be saved into the result window. Okay, so we have uh, five uh, you know windows in SAS. Now we will see what is the role of SAS in clinical research. Okay so we can do the basic research of clinical trial data okay in SAS. we can do the statistical analysis in SAS. we can create the graphs in SAS. okay different kind of graphs which are required to present to health authorities we can create in SAS. it we can uh, create a report in SAS. we can also generate the randomization of uh, patients like uh, which patient will receive which particular drug okay that randomization we can do in SAS. Uh, SAS is a one of the database we can store large volume of data and also the doc for the documentation purpose we use the SAS. Now we will see the clinical SAS work process. What actually we do in a clinical SAS industry okay when we conduct clinical trial. So this is the uh, workflow. So when we conduct the clinical trial worldwide okay not only in India we do the clinical trial globally okay so we have multiple sites globally uh, so <coughs> we collect the data uh, from the multiple site then this particular data will be sent to the cdm team that is called clinical data management team okay so clinical uh, data management team generally use the edc tool which is called electronic data capturing tool rave and oracle this platform they use and they just create the raw data from the clinical trial data after that this data will be sent to the SAS programming team which comprises of the three division 
वन इज एस डी टी एम टीम सेकेंड इज एडम टीम एंड थर्ड वन इज ए टी एफ एल टीम एस डी टी एम स्टैंड फॉर स्टडी डेटा टेबुलेशन मॉडल सो वी हैव स्पेसिफिक गाइडलाइन फॉर इट ओके यू यू कैन सर्च इन गूगल यू विल डेफिनेटली गेट इट इट इज फ्रीली अवेलेबल सो यूजिंग दिस एस डी टी एम गाइडलाइन ओके एंड सेस सॉफ्टवेयर वी कन्वर्ट दिस रॉ डेटा इन टू दिस स्टैंडर्ड डेटा सेट ओके एज पर द गाइडलाइन after that the standard data set will be sent to the adam team and they will create the analysis data set okay and using this analysis data set we create a report in terms of table figure and listing tfl stands for tables figures and listing so ultimately the raw clinical trial raw data we are presenting them in form of table figures and listing so it will be very easy for the health authorities and regulatory reviewers to review the clinical trial data okay now to whom we submit the data we submit this data to fda that is uh, health authority for us usa ema for europe and pmda for japanese health authorities okay so this sgtm adam and tfl all together comprises of submission package we called it as a submission package and we create final submission in define define is uh, you know one kind of xml file that we send to the health authorities and using this file they can easily access this data and review the this data so you can understand how important the role of ses is throughout the clinical trial okay now i will this is the one of the example of the raw data how raw data looks like when we uh, gather the information from clinical trial site okay the raw data will look like this i have taken uh, this particular data from the one of the live project of clinical trial okay uh, now using this raw data we we convert it to the standard data which is called sdtm okay this is the example of the demographic data so we should provide information about the patients like uh, what is the age of patient uh, what is the you know gender of the patient what is the race of patient what is the ethnicity of race, uh, patient when the subject start the trial that is our patient is when the subject ended the trial so all this information is called demographic data this is one of the domain okay of uh, ses programming After, from this uh, sgtm standard data set we convert it into the adam data set so adam data set will look like this and using this adam data set we create table figures and listing so your demographic table will look like this so you can imagine the how the raw data was uh, uh, look like and now how it is presented in form of table so we have gender bifurcation in male and female so uh, among the 14 patients uh, five were male nine were female likewise okay this is just an example age bifurcation okay then age group bifurcation all this thing i have presented in table all this thing i have created using the ses okay uh, listing will look like this like uh, this is a uh, treatment emergent adverse event listing so when patient is undergoing clinical trial so he may experience some adverse events okay so we present the adverse event in form of listing you can also create a figure in ses so this is one of the you know kaplan meier summary of relapse free survival table okay this is i have taken from one of the oncology clinical trial <clears throat> now we will see what is the growth of ses in clinical research okay so as of now the market size value in 2022 for a clinical trial is around 49.8 billion us dollar okay for clinical ses programming this particular data i have collected from the polaris market research which is one of the most prominent you know market research company from new york usa okay um, now the revenue forecast in 2030 the clinical ses programming market will be around 78.3 billion us dollar you can imagine what is the growth okay and the growth rate that is compound annual growth rate is of 5.8% from 2020 to 
30 okay so right now uh, the SAS programming is one of the most growing field in clinical research so you can imagine so if you find any opportunity if you get the entry level into the one of the MNC company your career will be booming up to the by 2030 you can imagine this thing okay uh, the SAS programming scope is not only in India it is spread worldwide so in which country uh, you, you can you know have the opportunity it includes mainly the us canada uk germany france italy spain china india japan so likewise you have opportunity worldwide so it is you know one of the booming field worldwide right now now this is most important slide because ultimately what we are doing anything we are doing we are doing for money right so i will uh, show you what is the scope of sas in india okay so if you are a fresher okay uh, and you have done some certification and some training for sas and you know the sas then as a fresher you can get up to the 4.5 lakhs per annum package at entry level okay uh, from zero to two years you can have 4.5 to 5.4 lakhs per annum uh, likewise uh, 5 to 10 years of experience then up to 10 to 12 lakhs you can get and if you have 10 plus experience in SAS, your package will be uh, more than 18 okay but right now i have seen that one of my friend who has around you know six to seven years of experience in clinical SAS program is getting more than 20 lakhs per annum package okay <clears throat> now why you should be in clinical SAS industry okay so actually uh, it is a big advantage of high earning okay due to the demand of this uh, SAS programming in clinical research field because right now we have lots of project okay in, in um, MNC companies but we have very less programmers right now because uh, uh, awareness of SAS is uh, is somewhat less okay so uh, we have opportunity in pharma industries plus CRO and uh, you know some uh, doctors pharmacists engineer MSc MCA MBA people who have more than five years of experience in their field have actually changed their f profile as a SAS programmer and right now they are working as a SAS programmer in industry and uh, in SAS programming career there is no recession like IT uh, even if in pandemic uh, no not a single person was you know fired from the uh, SAS programming uh, you know job and at that time as well we were recruiting the SAS programmers at that time as well okay and it is actually a best profile for girls why because in SAS programming you can also get the home based job like permanent work from home so you can know uh, uh, girls can also manage their uh, family and personal life along with their uh, professional life so you can have a better work uh, work life balance if you are in sas field okay now <clears throat> we will see what is the entry level job roles and growth in sas programming so if you are a fresher then you will be assigned a stat programmer resignation okay and uh, gradually once you grow uh, you will get stat programmer one and stat programmer two role so they generally do the programmings okay what i have discussed earlier and they will report to a slp slp stands for study lead programmer who will manage the whole clinical trial study in terms of programming okay he will allocate the uh, different different kinds of work to the stat programmer one and stat programmer two okay now slp reports to the manager manager is equivalent to associate director okay and manager will handle uh, uh four to five slps that is study lead programmers and uh, around four to five manager will report to the director okay now i will um, discuss this thing in terms of package now study lead programmer as a study lead programmer you will get around uh, 25 to 30 lakhs per annum as per the current market trend okay if you are a manager or associate director in the clinical SAS programming then uh, his package ranges from uh, 40 to 50 lakhs per annum and as a director he will get around 60 plus lakhs per annum package in clinical SAS programming this is the current market trend okay <coughs> now um, how we teach and train people okay in clinic minds okay as a SAS programming 
now we have a specially designed course and content as per the industry requirement to get the job so uh, actually we have prepared a particular course which is industry oriented uh, so you know when you uh, appear for any kind of uh, SAS program interview then you will be aware of the all terminologies like what you have to answer and how you should answer it okay and you will be trained for the proper knowledge of SAS programming so we are not only teaching the SAS, but apart from that, we are also teaching the clinical research. Okay, basic fundamentals of clinical research. What is CDISC? That is clinical SAS. CDISC stands for the Clinical Data Interface Standard Consortium. So, which is in layman term, we called it as a clinical SAS. Okay, there is a special guideline for it. And then interview preparation, like how you should prepare for the interview, and we also assist in the uh, resume update. Okay. And most important thing that this candidate will be prepared for industry oriented real time clinical SAS programming project workflow. So we actually create a dummy project. Okay. What actually, what we work in a real time in a, so we, we, we create a dummy project and uh, I will also provide the uh, sample codes for it. So, you know, candidate can run that particular code and he will understand like step by step like how these particular program works how you should write the program and how that particular data is manipulated in SAS and how we present that particular data so we will provide the all the material and after getting trained in SAS, the candidate can prepare quickly for the global SAS certification exam this SAS certification exam is not compulsory uh, because most of the CRO companies like TCS, uh, Pfizer, uh, that um, Sineos, Essential, IQA, they are not asking for the global SAS certification. Okay. But if you are appearing for the pharma, core pharma industry, industries like Pfizer, Novartis, Johnson & Johnson, they are asking for the certification. So if you have the certification in your hand, then it will be easy for you to easily get the entry into the clinical SAS industry so we assist in you know uh, how to clear that particular SAS exam it is a global certification exam like GRE TOEFL uh, you have to pay a 180 dollar and you have to just select the, your center and you have to appear for the exam it is an online exam so if you get more than 70 percentile then you will uh, you know get the SAS certification and SAS batch so you can fix that particular batch in your profile and your, on your linkedin profile and uh, you know you can uh, easily get the entry into the sas industries so uh, that's all about the sas and its scope so thank you very much for it and finally i would like to thank kamal sir and his team to present myself on a clinimind platform so thank you very much and uh, Neeraj, if you have any question then we can discuss it yeah thank you Neeraj, sir, for uh, Neeraj, sir, for your yeah you know, excellent presentation on SAS and by Dr. Vipra uh, Said, sir. Now we will take question. You can either post the questions on specific program related questions. I will, I think there were some questions whether these are the training programs. Yes, these are the training programs offered by Clinimind since 2004. Our programs are certified, accredited by the Licenses Sector Skill Development Council, Ministry of Skill Development, Government of India. Clinimans programs are job oriented, which means our programs are designed around skills, basically. So skills which are required by the company and the programs are designed around the job roles offered by the company like for example drug safety associate job or a pharmacovigilance executive job now our program is designed around that sas programmer job our course is designed around that clinical research program is designed around crc and cra role so hence all our programs are designed as per the industry standards we offer these certification programs and these programs are full-time and weekend options for working professionals there is a weekend option and there is an option of full-time three months uh, course as well uh, so now i'll take a very specific question please thank you very much and you can ask your question unmute yourself and ask one by one instead of you know uh, crowding this so one question I could read, uh, fees, fees details will be sent on the email uh, uh, to 
Uh, is it possible to do the SAS programming in three months? Yes. There is a program which we offer, weekend program, which is the six months duration. But we also have the full-time program where you can complete actually the SAS course in a uh, three-month period as well. You can ask questions. Do you want to unmute and voice questions, please? And we'll be happy to take voice questions. And uh, Hello. Hello. Yes, Weber. Yeah, go ahead. Hello. Yes, yeah, Weber here. Can, yeah, Weber, yes, you uh, yes, sir. In, in clinical sales, you will teach base and advanced also. Correct, sir. So, so the course which is there, clinical research, sales and clinical science, we teach, first we teach base and then we teach advanced sales, which is the clinical sales. Okay. And yeah. for interview, base sales certification is mandatory, right? No, it, as Nirav sir mentioned, for a lot of these consulting firms, they don't ask for the SAS certification. Uh, they ask for people who are well trained in SAS and can do the entry level jobs. But if you have to grow or go into the pharmaceutical companies, uh, go for the SAS certification. It's always helpful. We will prepare you for that exam, the uh, SAS exam, which is done. We will prepare you uh, for that. Amar Gaurav, you can ask your question, Amar. Oh, thank you. Hello, sir. Yeah, Amar. Uh, sir, I have completed MBC Chemistry. Okay. And I want to join CDM. Yes, uh, Amar. So, yes, you can. There is a clinical research and data management course we have. But uh, I have not a life science subject in my master's right. degree. That, that, that's all right. That's okay. That's fine. Uh. That's fine. So we can teach you clinical research and CDM, and we will then uh, give you the job placement opportunities in clinical research or data management. Yeah. Placement may koi, uh, matlab, placement may company ko chahiye na? Nee, koi, koi dekho, dekho, clinical research, data management. Aapne chemistry padha hai. So Haan. it's fine. And whatever the job roles are there, you really don't need to be a very very strong life sciences person these are the job roles where uh, which are now very you know generic so you can be easily trained and we have a lot of students like who uh, who have been trained in place yeah okay sir thank you yeah. uh, sir. Hello. yes uh, one by one please yeah Weber? Uh, hello sir yeah Yes, sir. we are from yeah. pharmacy manner and how much time it will take to learn such whole things and programming? Yes, so it's a three months, Weber. Uh, it's a three months course, I say. So you are a pharmacy yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, it is three months, but uh, we are non programming language, uh, non programming uh, background. Yeah, non coding. Yeah, 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 that's all right. Weber, Weber, I am also from, I have done MM in pharmacology. I am also from pharmacy background, but still I am right now SAS programmer in MNC yeah. company. So you have the case here, Weber. Oh, okay. Your sir is already the pharmacy student. So. Okay, okay. <laughs> thank you, sir. And there are a lot of pharmacy students Weber these days in this SAS course. Yes, there's a question by someone, you provide placement. Of course, the placements are the important part of our program. We prepare you for the job roles. We do the mock interviews. We prepare you for the interviews. Any writing tests, we prepare you for the technical test. And then we arrange the interviews with the company. And when we do all this, uh, the students uh, get placed. There's no problem. On the screen, if you see a lot of the placement records, we have over 8,000 placement records available with us. And you can all go through these, you know, uh, placement records given on the website and uh, see how the variety of students is there, people from the different qualifications, uh, whether it's life sciences, pharmacy, medical, dental, Ayurvedic, homeopathic, we get a cross section of students yeah. from different qualifications. I have a question. Oh. Yeah, yes, Regine, go ahead. Yeah. So, uh, are biotech uh, engineers uh, good for this course? Like, we can do this course? Yes, yes uh, Regine, of course you can do, but, but biotech, we also have another option for the engineers, actually. Another option is called business analytics, pharmaceutical business analytics. Now, there, 
the opportunity for the engineers is much higher. Uh, if you have people from the engineering background, biotech engineers, they can get into the as a business analyst role in the pharmaceutical sector. Now, very briefly, because we didn't have a time today, I think we had a long two sessions, three sessions. So we didn't cover today analytics, but very briefly, analytics is today integral part of the pharmaceutical sector business analytics so all of you hear business analytics word in the education space very common uh, whether various there are institutions which are there now analysts what they do the analysts help companies in taking important business decisions scientific medical uh, important business decisions which companies take that requires a lot of analysis of scientific and business data. So I think that's a career very suitable, Srijani, for you. We'll share the information. If you drop in your email ID here, I will share that particular information okay. uh, information with you as well. So if you can just post your sure. email ID, we will send you the information. And that's a Sorry. great uh, career and good salary starting salary for that career. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. So, someone is saying I'm already working as a statistical programmer. Kindly, could you please uh, speak your question? Uh, someone mentioned that I'm already working as a SAS programmer. Uh, uh, yeah. What is your question it's, then? Yeah, it's Jaya here. Hi, Jaya. Yeah, yeah uh, hello. Actually, I am already working as a statistical programmer in one of the MNC company, but my okay. project is uh, not regarding SDTM and Adam. It's okay. something regarding Unix software or Linux software. So oh, I am okay. thinking by doing a course in Clinimines, uh, can I get entry directly into the SDTM and Adam projects in any Definitely. another yes. form? Yes. Definitely. Yeah. If you have a definitely. SAS background and if you are working on SAS already, then you can definitely get it. It will be easy for you actually. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, thank yeah. You. We will we will share yeah. the information with you uh, after the you know session. Yeah. Thank you. More questions, please. We'll be happy to answer any more questions. And we are working for the next batches in October, so we will be shortly reaching out uh, uh, with the score structure, placement information, and everything else. We will, if you all can post your, you know, email IDs, uh, we will reach out uh, uh, with detailed information. Rest assured about the placement support is mand is mandatory for all of our programs. Uh, programs are government accredited. That's a one major advantage which Clinimines program has. We have a history as an organization since 2004. Our alumni today is on a very senior level positions with the pharma companies, research companies worldwide. So our alumni today is uh, uh, are important business decision makers uh, in the pharma healthcare uh, clinical research sector. Uh, any more questions, please? Hello, good afternoon, sir. I have one question. Yes, Farooq. Yes, Farooq. Go ahead. Sir, I completed my brief pharmacy. Sir, I just want to know that if I join as a clinical research and what is the higher position of this? I mean, from the starting. Okay. So, so Farooq, right. So, Farooq, if you join in uh, clinical research, so they'd say combination for a BPharm I'll recommend is clinical research and pharmacovigilance combination, which is the best for the job placement point of view. Now, you can start as a CRC, research coordinator, CTA role, then you become a CRA role, clinical research associate, and then you become a project manager. So higher you can go is the president in any company, president, director level. And there are cases, hundreds and hundreds of cases, thousands of cases. People who started as a CRC are today at a very, very senior management roles. So how you work, commitment, ethics, hard work, scientifically oriented mind. If you work well towards it, there's no way you cannot grow. You can grow substantially in this sector. So thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Any more questions? So M Farm, sir, I completed. Rohan, can you read out your question, Rohan? Yes, sir. 
सर आई कंप्लीटेड माय एम फॉर्म इन फार्माकोलॉजी एंड वांट टू गो इन फार्माकोविजिलेंस सर राइट रॉन या परफेक्ट सो वेरी गुड प्रोग्राम फॉर यू रॉन व्हिच इन व्हिच ईयर यू पास्ड आउट योर एम फॉर्म दिस मंथ सर दिस मंथ ओके ग्रेट सो वी हैव अ एक्सीलेंट प्रोग्राम इट्स कॉल्ड advanced postgraduate diploma in clinical research and pharmacology uh, the program will give you the complete uh, understanding in the skill set required to work in this sector and as a in pharmacology drawn in which city uh, okay sir and can i assure myself about the placement sir absolutely where are you located drawn okay sir no where are you sir, located drawn where do you live uh, sir, i am from nagpur sir and for so uh, the you should be prepared to come to the major cities because majority of the farm goodlands operations are yes. from the 6 to 7 important yes, cities yes. as long yes. as you are okay to come to pune bangalore bombay all the major cities we will be now there is a question good question about the training on the offline or offline you know since covid or even prior to covid clinimines have been offering online classes these are the live sessions like today we are interacting we are talking to each other we are running these trainings online on zoom or uh, teams or google meet live sessions every day monday to friday classes for the full time and these are the four hours every day you learn live uh, and then we provide you the placement activity placement support fully provided there is no difference between the offline and the online classroom they all are same uh, rather we believe now and this is the feedback of this almost 1000 students who did this program during covid is this is very efficient medium of learning uh, because you don't have to travel uh, to the classes uh, you are learning on your computer at home there are lot of softwares we will be sharing so even if you learn in a classroom there is no lab required in this industry there is no lab per se so you your lab is the computer basically so your computer at home we will be sharing softwares you will be getting trained on these softwares training becomes much more efficient and low cost so what happens uh, we have brought down the fees by at least 40% from what we used to offer in the classroom in the pre covid times and now at the lower cost you are still getting the same placement same content more software more training and last but not least today we have a ability to train you from anywhere in the world my trainer one trainer in pharmacology lens is from us one from bangalore my farm, my clinical research team is from bangalore hyderabad and delhi my data management expert is sitting in delhi and bombay or one train uh, trainer in us so you have a ability to learn from top trainers today because it's a matter of just connecting in the early and days pre covid pre pandemic world you cannot bring expert from america to teach you because at the end of the day everything is a cost so we have been able to bring down the cost and we have passed down that cost benefit uh, to the students actually Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So, yeah. So it's a very good mechanism to very good methodology to learn. Actually, nowadays with the technology today, things are much easier. Actually, uh, Madhuri branch branch is where are you located, Madhuri? We have admission centers in Bangalore, admission centers in Bombay, uh, Delhi, Kerala. Uh, Uh, we have a admission center in Guwahati. So admission, yeah. So uh, Aroli is there. We have a Vashi admission center. You can visit our admission center. For Aurangabad, you can do online. Ahmedabad, you can do online admissions right now. Actually, so your admission does not matter. Center does not matter. As I said, whether the Lucknow, Pune, or is the extreme part of India. Today, I am getting the student from. anywhere everywhere i am repeating we need not have center in every city uh, you will be learning online so you can admit yourself through over delhi and noida and office or if you have a, if you are from maharashtra you can get admission in bombay center so center does not matter today it's all about our 
you know delivery mechanism online from anywhere in the world today our students are from us for example we have a course starting this evening in drug safety management advanced drug safety management so a lot of students in that course are from us and europe so today with the help of technology location does not matter world is flat absolutely flat now yes there is aishwarya you have a question please Ashwarya, you want to ask a question? No, there is no discount as such. You know, you don't start with a discount. Uh, we offer a very, you know, uh, fees which is the efficient and there are no discounts. We don't ask for discounts in less education. We don't give you, we don't ask for discounts that will give you one opportunity. We will give you support till you are fully placed good programs software trainings content government accredited program education does not have discounts you know discounting is bad we'll be sharing the fee details shortly on the emails please all done for bad Yes, September batch started. Uh, we already have the enrollments now happening for the October batch. So any student who is interested in the October, please reach out to the business development team, Mr. Vinayak or Mr. Rajat or Kemi at the head office or Mr. Surya at Bangalore uh, or Anisa at our Kerala center. Uh, so or uh, Mr. Netra at our Guwahati center. Uh, so we'll be happy to facilitate your admission process in the next few days. Uh, there is also announcement regarding the bank loans. We do have uh, interest-free bank loans available for the students, and we'll be happy to over 700 students benefited from these interest-free education loans. If you have someone from the family who will support your loan, guarantee your loan, there is a bank loan available interest free no catch that why interest free there must be some catch no catch is interest free education loan you're not charged any interest you will pay the loan back in nine emis so your anyone your spouse or parents or brother sister siblings can sponsor loan if they are working and uh, no catch is the interest free loan that's it So I have another question. Uh, yes, ma'am. So, so uh, Clinimines is offering the pharmaceutical business analytics analytics uh, course, sir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Srijani, we have been offering that program now for almost three okay. years now, and we have excellent okay. placements for the business analytics course. We'll share the information with you. Okay, so sure. Have Thank you shared you. your email ID? Your yes, sir. I have shared, sir. Okay. Okay, Srijani. Thank you, sir. I don't know, Mr. Dinesh Pandey is there or not. He is over business analytics because we had a short time today. So uh, we could yeah, not there make a detail. Yeah. Hi, hi, Dinesh, yeah. sir. You can quickly maybe introduce yourself, sir. And... Yeah, yeah. So everyone, right, I'm Dinesh and I'm part of this business analytic course. So, right, uh, business analytic course, right, is one of the course which have started uh, we started three years back because there was the lack of students coming into this and the awareness of this course is uh, very less uh, and the course is very lucrative because this course uh, serves the complete us market and europe market and uh, this course has a high potential of growth and to start with good salaries and good learning so this course have uh, different modules and all we can uh, we will have a different session on that and then uh, the people who want to attend that then we can take from there Thank you, Kamali. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Thank you, Dinesh. Thank you very much. There were more questions people have written. Would you like to read out if you have any questions? What is the last date? Uh, admissions are ongoing, uh, Sangeeta. So the third week of September is the cutoff. At this stage, anyone who wants to take admission, you can pay 5,000 rupees and register. You have to pay first installment. Uh, 
of the fees uh, only one week before so you can pay the fees in three installments or you can go with the bank loan option at this stage just pay 5000 this 5000 is only uh, part of the fees it's not extra so right now you can just do the registration <laughs> Any other questions? Ashil, thank you for your suggestion. We will open Ahmedabad Center shortly. Thank you for your suggestion. Oh, hello, sir. Yes, Sushma, go ahead. Yes. So, what I was my question is uh, for the training of, along with you, will you be providing internships too? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The program in Clenimines, the advantage is all of our programs have built in internship. We have a tie up with the CRO called. Uh, uh, Thinkai. Thinkai is the one of the you know CROs which offers various you know solutions to the pharma sector. Uh, your internship certificate will come from Thinkai. Okay, sir. And Thank it will so be much. ongoing, ongoing internship along with the course. Along with okay, so sir, uh, if it's a three months course, like um, I want to to uh, do a three months, so it will be a week week day or weekend or one yeah 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 so it's a simultaneously running with your program it's a simultaneous with your program okay, okay yeah. Sir. Yeah. yeah thank you sir thank you If you don't have any more questions, I wish you all the best for the rest of the day. Enjoy your Sunday. And uh, we will be in contact with all of you. Thank you very much. If you have not posted your email ID, kindly post your email ID so that we can share the information with you. Thank you. All the best. Thank you, Nirav, sir. Thank you, Dinesh, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Thank you, sir. Thank you, Kumar, sir. Thank you everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you, sir. Thank you, thank you everybody, bye-bye, take care. Thank you.